<laughs> All right, gangsters. <laughs> All right, we're good. We're good. We got we it. We good. got it. We got it figured out. Sound check was a success. All right. Uh, if you're wondering what my background is, I am in a suite in the Encore at Wynn. Don't come by to visit. Uh, I've never I've never been in this hotel. Have you, Mike? Nope. How is it? The room it's looks good. nice. Yeah. No. It's it's beautiful. What's what's not to like? Uh, the sphere is right next to me, on the left. Like it's the view out my window is the sphere. I feel like what's that's it? the view out everyone's window these days. What uh what is on the sphere right now? Just ads for the sphere. <laughs> like there's no smiley face or anything. Uh, all right. So I'm in Las Vegas. Uh, Michael is on Long Island. We are ready to play. An all new round of what are your thoughts? Welcome to the show tonight, guys. I uh, want to say a couple of quick shout outs, real quick. Uh, Tom Whalen is here. Midwest Cannabis. Cliff is back. Chris Hayes is back. Uh, let's see who else. Let's let's see some new people that we haven't shouted out. AK Wheeler, what's up? Mike Skyros, Georgie D. Uh, Drew Hickman is here. Bob Sacamano, welcome. Jay Luther, hi. All right, we. Oh, Jonathan Gott, hello from Uruguay. Well, what nice. do you know? Hey, Jonathan, thanks for joining us tonight. Dave Ari, Rachel, all right, all the gangsters are here tonight. Um, it's uh, the start of earnings season. These are always some of the more fun shows to do, and uh, we're actually going to start off with that. But before we do, I hear there's a sponsor tonight. Michael, who is sponsoring the show? I just got signed out of my account. How about that? Sign back in. Uh-oh. Wrong password. Well, this is problematic. Uh, the sponsor you? of today's show is... What'd you, what'd, you get si- what'd you get signed out of? Friendster? What the heck just happened? Uh, we hear you. We see you. All right. Well, good thing I have two computers. Not to brag. No big deal. Um, the sponsor of today's show is Y Charts. Did you know every quarter they do like a top 10 charts of the quarter? Hand yes. curated by them? Yes. Uh, it's tremendous. Visuals galore. Great for sharing for clients. Great for learning. There we go. Uh, if you would like to take advantage of... As a new customer of Y Charts and get 20% off, contact them, tell them that we sent you, and that's how you do it. And one more thing, Ben that's and cool I, feature. Ben and I are doing the uh, end of year webinar this year with Y Charts. So that'll be that'll oh, be the first exciting. week of December. Uh, all right, exciting. I am a little bit a little bit shook that I got signed out of my account, but at least I have access to this. What one. account right, so did you wait? Good. What account did you get signed out of? Is it like the work one? Oh, all right. Uh, earnings. So Michael filled in a lot of the gaps for me here because I've been in transit all day, but I just wanted to start off by saying, and then we'll we'll pop some charts. If your reason to not want to be in stocks right now is because of earnings, you have the wrong reason. It's not uh, my personal opinion. It is not going to be the thing uh, that knocks the market off course. By the way, it hasn't all year. We have had declining earnings for the record. Uh, They weren't as bad as people were projecting as recently as the first quarter of this year. Um, And this time around, if you think about an average quarter where the market does about 3% better than expectations, if that's what we come in with this time, we'll be solidly positive uh, on a year-over-year basis, which, uh, not to brag, pretty good. (laughs) And certainly not as bad as some of the worst expectations that were out there in the first half of the year. Um, want you want to do some of these charts, Michael, while you get your your situation resolved? <laughs> I just told Nick that this is sort of urgent. I'm good for now, but if I get kicked out of the Mac, I am sunk. All right, all right, let's let's get it on. So, okay, as Josh mentioned, so we're early, right? We've had a, uh, what is this like the second week of earnings season? So yeah, forgive me we, if Josh we haven't seen much. Forgive me if Josh had this. I was obviously typing uh, to try and get my password back. But so we're reporting year over year revenue growth of 1.9. This would be the 11th straight quarter of revenue growth. That's not bad. Yeah. So, so yes, costs are going up. But eight out of the 11 sectors are actually supposed to have positive earnings per share growth in this quarter. And I think the, the biggest gain is going to be in communication services. They're estimating 31.5% year over year, which is uh, kind, of, kind of explosive. I don't fully understand what's going on there. Consumer discretionary sector is going to have uh, 20% growth, and a lot of that's obviously going to have to come from Amazon if it's going to happen. Uh, if if you actually pulled Amazon out, it would it would be a decline. So oh, really? whenever it's that you big? talk of it, yeah. So whenever you 
according to FactSet, consumer discretion would be down 14% if you pulled Amazon out. And th uh, this is one of the points that I wanted to make. Whenever you're looking at earnings on a sector basis, you have to adjust for the fact that in every sector, there's like two or three companies that matter the most. And oftentimes when you're just saying, oh, we're going to have uh, – we're, we're going to have consumer discretionary up 22%. Yeah, but it's a lot of it is uh, an artifact of how bad Amazon's quarter was a year ago versus what this time around is going to bring. How do so we adjust? How do we adjust? Sell side research? I guess I think mentally uh, adjust. Oh, a mental adjustment. Oh, okay. That's good. Yeah. That's, that just, helps. Just remind yourself the, the sector is not growing profits 22% a year in real life. There's a giant waiting issue there with the biggest company in, in the space. That's, that's all, all I'm saying. All right, so we spoke about what we're expecting at the index level um, in, in, terms of, in terms of revenue growth. So 66% have already beaten, which is basically in line with the five-year average of 68%. That's top line. Uh, bottom line, though, we got some good news. 84% have beaten, and we're expected to... That's way high. We're expected... Now, that'll come down, obviously, as we get more, yeah. more companies reporting. The S&P is expecting 0.4% year-over-year earnings growth for Q3, which is the first quarter of earnings growth that's year-over-year -year since Q3 since a year ago. So, right. So if you get that, then the narrative that earnings have to come down, earnings are coming down, you have to throw that out. Like, so back to my original point: if your reason for uh, not wanting to be in stocks right now is there's going to be some sort of earnings. Uh, recession, like it's time. It's time to change your narrative because that's not going to be the thing. No, we did that. The thing that we did that already. What'll knock this market off course is going to be something else. I don't think it's going to be corporate profits, at least not in the S and P five hundred. And I think right. that's like my, my biggest takeaway. So I I leaned on a fantastic Substack called the Transcript for some of the best quotes so far from banks, um, and J P Morgan, the CFO, said. We are seeing a trickle. Actually, before we get to this, what did you make of Jamie Dimon's comments that like we might be living in the most dangerous times in in decades? Like, is that not is that crazy recency bias? Why does he talk like that? I don't think he's re referencing financial conditions. I think he's referencing geopolitics, and he focuses a lot on that. And by the way, a year ago he was saying like perfect storm or something. Uh, early early this year, hurricane, he, hurricane. Uh, I love – listen, I'm a shareholder in J.P. Morgan, and I love that he sandbags the shit out of Wall Street every every chance he gets. He is a guy that did not take the bait and load up on all these low-interest mortgages uh, over the last couple of years. And now you see Bank of America um, living with this shit on their balance sheet. They're upside down on $100 billion plus worth of mortgages, and J.P. Morgan isn't. And he just he's, – he's a risk manager first. And that's like the – that's the swagger. That's the persona that he's cultivated on the street, and it's backed up by the way he actually behaves. He's a guy that fig figures, look, banking's a simple business. Focus on risk, and the profits will take care of themselves. And that's what he's done, and that's what he's doing right now. So now, I don't think well, when he's – the most dangerous time – I don't think he's reference. I don't think he's referencing financial anything. I think he's talking about Israel uh, and uh, in the Middle East. Well, fine, fair enough, and and obviously not to minimize what's going on over there. But is this more dangerous, uh, the conflict between Palestine and Israel, than when the United States was in the Middle East for however many years we were there? I don't. I don't know how you quantify it. I. I think. Uh, this I may be the most dangerous time the world has seen in decades. Whatever. That's a. I mean, that's a direct quote. You could take with it what you want. Yes. But. Is listen. Yes. I think. I think it's. I think it's reasonable to say that Israel's in nuclear power. Iran is very much involved in all this bullshit. And yes, I think it's a reasonable statement. And I don't. I. I don't think everything that he says is like a a market call. I think sometimes he's talking about just the overall environment, and he's a global. He represents a global financial company, so no matter what's going on somewhere in the world, there will be some impact on J.P. Morgan on financial markets, uh, and that's that's what he's saying. I I I don't think that he like the second sentence in that is not so. Make sure you go out and sell everything. 
Like, right, that's just right. not the way he talks. Um, so. All right, so, so getting back to the comment, we are seeing a trickle of charge-offs. This is from J.P. Morgan CFO. Uh, a trickle of charge-offs coming through the office space. You see that in the charge-off number of the commercial bank, but the numbers are very small and more or less just the realization of the allowance that we've already built there. So that's, so that's on the, the one. That's the CFO, yeah. H however, uh, on the Goldman call from earlier today, Bank of America analysts, I just want to make sure I heard you correctly. Did you say you marked your exposure by 50% in the commercial real estate office? Yes. To clarify, for our commercial real estate in the office space, we've either marked or impaired that down by 50%. That's quite significant. Yeah, I'd say. Yeah, that's a big that's a big deal. I don't think Goldman is that big of a player in that, in that space. I don't think they're like a top three uh, player in CRE, but... Listen, it's, this is the reality. The thing about, as we've talked about a lot, the thing about commercial real estate, if that's the bomb that you're waiting to go off, it's going to be a really slow motion uh, detonation that's probably going to frustrate the bulls and the bears. The, 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 the owners of office properties extend and pretend the banks do the same thing. It's a big game. In the end, the banks do not want to end up owning these properties. They have, there's nothing for them to do with them. There will be numerous refinancing opportunities along the way. A lot of this commercial real estate is owned by real estate families, dynasties, if you will, and they just don't let go. They don't give in that easily. This is not going to be a situation where all of a sudden one quarter, like every building on every balance sheet is going to have to be uh, marked as impaired. Well, I get just, this. I just don't so, see it going that way. Supporting that is the, the, uh, the CFO from Wells Fargo. He said... The hard part of office right now is that there aren't a lot of trades happening yet. There's a few in certain cities and they're all a little bit different in their complexion. So you still have somewhat limited information in the price discovery of a lot of places. Uh, so yeah, there you go. There's just, there's, and there's just also, there's also a huge difference in like a buildings versus B buildings there. They might be next to each other in the alphabet. These are two different worlds. These are not comparable in any way, shape or form. A buildings, class one buildings in the best neighborhoods, in the best metropolitan cities are not fungible uh, with, with B buildings. And C buildings aren't even worth talking about. They're, they're a spec. So that's another aspect of this. I know there's a lot of people, they've, they've drawn the, the, they've connected the dots. They said, okay, uh, work from home is a new reality. None of this office space is worth what it was. There's a lot of debt. Therefore, blow up. It, it's it's going to be really frustrating if, well, slow if, motion. if that's what you think is going to happen here. Yeah. When is that? When is our okay. lease up? 20, 2028? Our lease is up in 2028, but we're the idiots that are going to take more space, not less. Well, uh, but, but that's what I'm, but my point is that my point is that it's just it's rolling. All right, yes. let's talk about let's talk about Goldman for a second. Uh, so, third quarter net revenues were essentially unchanged year over year reflecting significantly lower net revenues in asset and wealth management, which were offset by higher net revenues in global banking and markets uh, and platform. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but they took a $506 million write down uh, in Green yeah. Sky, which is, you know, it's a ton of money. John, throw this chart up, I, uh, this this yellow text up. I can't read it off the screen. I gotta, gotta okay, there we go. Um, all right, equity investments reflected net losses from investments in private equities due to net losses from real estate investments and significantly lower net gains from company-specific events. Uh, so private, they took a $170 million write-down compared to a $505 million gain uh, in the same quarter a year ago. I mean, that's, that's a monster swing. And then public, down $40 million compared with a $220 million gain a year ago. Yeah, look, uh, Goldman is cleaning, cleaning things up from the from the bubble years and they did a lot of adventurous stuff and they're not going to do it again. You're going to see Goldman get very conservative now. I mean, you have seen that obviously they want nothing to do with consumer lending bullshit. Um, they want very little to do with it. It appears based on news reports. They want very little to do with lending to the consumer credit, uh, credit cards. They, they want out of these businesses and what, what they'll do you get think out, they'll get out. What do you think their compensation, uh, expense was just quarter over quarter just quarter over quarter well, well not enough because they're trying to murder this guy like a shakespearean play so what what, what, what you tell me do you have the number 16 percent. that's growth wild 
16 percent growth. Since last quarter. Since last quarter. Yeah. Compensation it's not wild. response. There's a palace it's- coup underway. Do you understand, like, every partner at Goldman Sachs is on the phone with uh, the New York Post, like, like on a weekly basis this summer? They're try- trying, to, trying to get rid of this guy, planting stories about him. It's not, it's not surprising at all. The, the bonus pool is down year over year. That's the headline. So that happened in the first quarter. Once that happens, it sets in, in motion a chain of events. The bottom line is people do not like to get paid less uh, one year than they were paid the prior year. Oh, Nobody takes it well. Nobody takes it well. That's the bottom line. All so. right, Anna just saved me because I just got kicked out on the Mac as well. But now I'm back. All right. Whew. Now we're All right. cooking with Welcome. gas. Welcome back. What are these ETF uh, institutional long-term charts? This is, pr- this is, uh, yeah. Mike, walk us, th- walk us through what this is. Sorry, I'm just locking back in. Um, okay. The point that I wanted to make here is not necessarily, I mean, the top left is, 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 uh, organic growth assets. I'm sorry that that doesn't make sense. (laughs) It's flows into ETFs. And of course, 2021, uh, was in 2020, which is not on this chart, which is, you know, crazy, crazy, crazy behavior. We all know that. But the chart that I want you to look at is look at the bottom left one. Okay. What we're looking at is the black lines are operating income. Which this are is black, this is BlackRock specific. This is BlackRock. So yeah. we're down, or, or they're down, I should say, from their peak in 2021. Again, this probably peaked in 2020, but they haven't made any progress since 2020. It's been it's been sideways. Guess this what? Is operating income and margin on the ETF business specifically, or the no, 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 no. Company? This is this is the entire company. Then their operating margin is that's not that's not going the right way right it's going from the upper left to the lower right and so just i just want to make the basic point that if you saw these numbers you'd say yeah i bet the stock's not doing so well john try on please yeah stock's not doing so well neither is the business it's fine yeah it's fine it's It's not terrible but it's 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 not going net net income and earnings per share are going higher so what accounts for that they're buying back stock they're they're buying back stock yeah all right so Uh, that's what you have to that's what you have to do in some periods of time Let's do Schwab for a second. Net income for Q3 was 1.1 billion compared to 2 billion in the same quarter last year. Uh, I know you're not a math guy, but that's down Dude, 50%. That is, that is dramatic. <laughs> that is um, a dramatic drop in in uh in net income. So net interest revenue, which is I think it's 60% of their earnings, I think. They're a bank. Uh, net interest yeah. revenue is down 24% year over year. So that's the bad news. There is some good news. Year to date We've attracted 248. This is Walt Bettinger on the call, or in the, in the report, I should say. We've attracted 248 billion dollars of core net new assets from accounts originally opened at Schwab, so which not is not the an, TD merger, which is an annualized okay. growth rate of over six percent. Again, year to date, Schwab accounts only, 248 billion dollars. That is a ton of money. Where is that coming from? Great the sidelines. Like, good, good marketing. No, but yeah, really, where is that? <laughs> I don't I know. Mean, how, how did they do that? They, wait, they added they added a quarter of a trillion dollars year to date. Yeah, I, I read that. We three have times no idea ago. where it's coming from. Okay, all right, good. Oh, congrats. Doing congrats. It. congrats, the economy's doing well, gentlemen. Congrats on the quarter. But cash sorting is still the story, and it so hasn't this, stopped this, yeah. yet. So a couple of great charts. Um, all right, they call it cash for realignment the, for the audience. Let's let's just like all right, cash realignment, all right. cash sorting. So, Michael, so, will so you give off. people let's, a definition of this? Yeah. Okay. So chart off, please. So if you just have if you just have money in Schwab, it's it's a bank. It's effectively a bank, and so they put they sweep it into their their cash management program, and they basically they give you nothing and they take from them everything. Is that a line from uh, Gladiator? Uh, I think so. And so, but so but now after Silicon Valley Bank, which really woke people up to the fact that holy shit, I could get at the time four percent of my cash, four and a half percent. There was a tipping point where there was just a massive exodus out of their sweet program and into something that yields what people deserve, which is what, what the Fed funds rate is, which is which was 5%. Yeah. And so instead of them taking all of that difference and earning it in their pockets, you're earning it. Smart person who moved their money out. So that's, that's a huge drag. Now the good news yeah. is most of that's done. So they showed the number of first, John, you don't have to put the chart on. Okay. So let me just say, and then I'll, you can put the chart on. So number of first time, they're calling it realignment events. Number of first time people that are moving the money out is down 57% from the peak in March, okay. 2023. 
So if you were going to move, you moved. You did. And now even better, the size of the average realignment, which makes sense, right? If you had $100,000 in cash, you're getting the hell out of there. That's a lot of money, right? Yeah. If you have like $700 in cash, I mean, so, so, so not only if you were going to move, you did, but if you had a lot of money, you already did that. So the size of the average realignment is down 76% from the peak. So now, John, please chart on. So on top, you're looking at, I'm sorry, the previous one. There we go. So on top, you're looking at the average daily pace of net cash realignment. And there was just a, a yeah, massive you exodus. It, you could see it shrinking. Just a massive yeah, other, exodus. I wanted to ask you about, so a lot of times when we say cash sorting or cash realignment, it's not necessarily people leaving Schwab. They're trading from a core money market account that's yielding nothing into a Schwab product that's got yield, like a, like, a, like a Schwab higher end money market fund, but they just, they have to do it deliberately themselves. It's not gonna you sweep You have to buy there. it. They don't, the, the, the sweep, it. The sweep is it. not even, a, it's nothing. It's, but it's you can too, do it in your Schwab account is my point. And yeah, but you have to do it, you have to do it. So that's not always money leaving, uh, that's not always money leaving an institution. Sometimes it's just that sorting, but either way they make less money. Well, you could also buy a different money market fund. You don't necessarily have to buy the Schwab one. Um, yes. But then the money is not leaving Schwab the institution, it's, but it's leaving shareholders' pockets, right? It's just that's right. The, the spread is it's less getting, profitable. It's less the spread profitable. Is, the spread that's is it. getting smushed. But as you could see, the bank sweep flows are positive for the first time since March 2022. So you have to think that absent another, no, nah, absent nothing. If you were going to move, you already moved, okay? And now the question is: Is that reflected in the stock? I don't know. The stock got killed, so we know this well, is not. The stock got the stock got killed, but. Profits got cut in half too, from from a year from a year ago, right? You just you gave me a figure, net income two billion to one point one billion. So seen through that prism, I know it's only one quarter; it's not a full year. But seen through that prism, the sell off in the shares is like somewhat justified. It was a hundred absolutely, stock? absolutely. The stock got cut in half. Right now, and look and so did their quarterly profits. This quarter. I don't I don't own the stock, but I am of the opinion that. Uh, Schwab is the brand leader. They have 12%, they have 12% market share. We speak about how nobody has market share. They actually do. They have 12% yeah. of the $65 trillion in retail money. Uh, so I would think that most of the bad news is behind them and any, Listen, anything. We're, right, you and I are a little conflicted. We do business with Schwab. They're one of our favorite companies to work with. We have client assets at Schwab, obviously. So just to get that out of the way. That being said, we do business with a lot of companies. Schwab is pretty awesome. Like. If, and, and in the eyes of when we talk to prospective clients, people come to us, if they have money at Schwab, they really don't want to leave Schwab. They'll work with us at Schwab gladly. Um, people really like their, their accounts there, and they like the services that Schwab offers. Um, for people who don't have assets at Schwab, and we're going to move their assets there, nobody ever says, no, not Schwab. They, I mean, the reputation – and the service is, is amazing. And you're right. They are a brand leader. So it's not as though they are the only company facing cash realignment issues. Every, every, every financial institution, every bank, it's, it's a universal issue. It, the environment's changed. But I think by now, it's been changed for long enough that, to your point, we're not going to see another explosion in new cash realignment activity. So I think a lot. I think the stock has been very, very de-risked. Now, how do they grow their way out of this? I, that's another. That's another conversation. I don't have. A, I don't have a good answer for that. All right. So two more charts that are, that are that are worth sharing. Uh, select client cash metrics. So this is from 2014 to today, mm -hmm. and what they're showing is cash as a percentage of total client assets. Probably peaked uh, that 50%. I'm guessing that's that's March 2020, but whatever. Um, but what you what you see is that. It's never less than 10%. And if I had to say one thing is a great advertisement for to why you should hire a financial advisor, uh, obviously I'm biased, but this is the chart. People just generally speaking, for, for you know usually no reason, hold way too much cash in their portfolio. Now, finally, cash as, a, as an asset class is, is not a bad thing. In fact, it's probably it's a great thing. But just generally speaking, to have 10% in, in, in cash when cash is literally yielding you zero, that's not a good decision. Yeah, I guess it's like define like somebody says, should I have ten percent of my liquid net worth in cash? We'll define cash. Is it cash yielding a basis point? 
or is it cash yielding five, 500 basis points? Right. Because it's not, it's now no longer, there's now no longer a universal answer to how much should I have in cash. There, now the nuance is, well, what are you doing? Like it's cash, but cash doing what? Right. One so, more, one more chart that, that uh, supports uh, us financial advisors is the next chart, please. So what this is showing is quarterly daily average trades for the entire pie. And I, I don't know what the mix of assets oh are. Oh, my let's God, just, this is hilarious. Is I'm AS just, advi advisors supervised? Advisor, advisor, oh, services. advisor services. So okay. let's, just say, let's just say it's roughly equal. <laughs> I, I, again, right. forgive me. I don't know what the exact numbers are. But let's just say it's, it's split between, between DIYers and advisors. The money, uh, at, well, the money at Schwab, you said. Yes, yeah, 78% of the trades, of the total trades, are done by retail. And what yeah. happens when you trade? Do t things tend to go well? I you can attest. Create, you, from you create alpha. <laughs> from experience. Obviously, what do you mean? I do not beat. I do not beat my four hundred one k. You extract alpha from the market, science Boom. surgically, surgically extract. Uh, that's funny. So it. I mean, it makes sense. I. I would guess that. A, I would guess that a retail Schwab account would have more trading activity than an advisor-driven account, simply for the fact that do-it-yourselfers or do-it-yourselfers because. Sometimes they just haven't found someone to work with, but all, but most they of the like, time they like the action. They enjoy it. Yeah, they want to. They want their hands on it, and they want to do stuff. So extract away. I'm all I over it. it. All right. <laughs> enough about earnings. Enough about earnings. Let's talk about a potential luxury slowdown. Not, uh, not in my house, but okay. <laughs> I promise uh, you that. Okay. Full speed. The, full speed ahead. <laughs> <laughs> the French group. This is LVMH. Controlled okay. by billionaire Bernard Arnault, said on Tuesday that sales grew 9% in the third quarter, down from a 17% rise in the preceding quarter. Here's a quote. After three roaring years and outstanding years, growth is converging towards numbers that are a little more in line with historical average. As far as the aspirational customers, and particularly in the U.S. is concerned, we have reported already some pressure on that front in the first half of the year. And unfortunately, there was nothing new there. So this, this really surprised me. Next chart on, please. So this is directly from the, the report, and they break it down in the U.S., oh, J Japan, Europe. That's great. And what the heck happened in the United States? And more, what's happening in Japan? Japan, the stock market. Do you know that you know the Japanese stock market is kicking the shit out of every asset class on the in the world this year? Do you know that? You I know, don't that. know that. You told me. I mean, I, uh, but, but, the but Nikkei, why? the Nikkei is going gorillas right now. So that's that's what accounts for that. I think it's very very simple. Um, look, I'm going to tell you that United States is a stimmy story. When they say the aspirational customer, here's what they're really saying. These are people that in normal times are not buyers of Louis Vuitton merchandise. Maybe, maybe they buy themselves one thing every five years. Like they buy one bun bag or they buy like one, like one piece from Louis and that's their, that's their Louis bag. That's the aspirational. The aspirational customer thought it was a regular customer in 2020, 2021, 2022. It was retail therapy. It was people that um, were, were getting a lot of assistance. And there was also a stock market bubble and a real estate bubble. So that aspirational customer, I think, is not coming back until the next bubble. And it could be a while, given where interest rates are right now. So Louis has to rely on their regular customer. And the regular customer is doing just fine. And I think that's reflected in, in these results and the results that we're seeing elsewhere. You know what we're going to go back to now? Remember the term affordable luxury? There's, not, there's nothing affordable about real luxury. The prices have like doubled. Like Chanel doubled their prices. I have, a, I have like insider knowledge in my home about all this stuff. So I'm just going to tell you like it's not affordable luxury at all uh, in regular luxury. Why did Lululemon make an all-time high? Uh, was that yesterday? They add, add to Getting the added to the S&P 500. Yeah. Why is that company on fire? It's more expensive than, than stuff that you would buy at The Gap, but it's an affordable luxury. It's something people aren't going to stop doing. Mm -hmm. Like It's not luxury luxury. It's just nicer than. And that's what's going on right now. And the stocks that are working are the stocks that are answering that call. People don't necessarily want to stop shopping. We found out from retail sales numbers, uh, they blew it out, retail sales today. Um, people are not going to stop buying. They're in the mode. But they're going to stop buying uh, Louis, Prada, 
Well, so, so, so here's what they stopped buying. It's actually not so bad. They stopped buying. They stopped oh, buying. Wa- they stopped buying wines and spirits. Right. They stopped spending stupid stopped money on champagne. Stopped buying watches. Good. Good. Next chart, please. Stopped buying luxury watches. So, all right. So, wines and spirits is getting demolished again. Probably. I don't. I don't know exactly why. Whatever. Maybe the stimmy's over. People rich, aren't popping rich champagne. People, rich people on on Ozempic. So yeah, there it is. Uh, so, but fashion and leather goods is still growing solidly, up sixteen percent. Perfume is kind. Of, I mean, it's still fine. Watches are up nine percent, so it's it's not that yeah, bad. It's just fine. wines and spirits got crushed. Uh, the it's stock fine. though, stock's under pressure. Next chart, please. That's year to date. So why are we comparing it to the S and P? Just because? I don't know. Just because. Okay, um, I'd be interested to see it versus Europe, but it's okay. Um, th- this is like really the only true luxury play. There are two others. One Apple. is. Uh, ca- well, yeah, diff- yeah, for me, that's a different category. Uh, Caring, which owns Gucci and a bunch of other brands. And there's a third one, uh, Richemont, which owns Cartier. Um, but they're all they're all uh, based in Europe, trading in the United States as ADRs. But LVMH is like the real uh, bellwether for the group and probably always will be. So it's in a 30% drawdown. Uh, since yeah. Josh said that he likes luxury, he doesn't like Dollar General. That's right. Listen to this. Well, I, didn't, I didn't buy the stock. Listen to this. Uh, I saw a great survey from John Huber. Buffett was describing the power of Apple, speaking of Apple, and said, would you rather get $10,000 or give up the right to own an Apple product for the rest of your life? 15... You, know Warren Buff- you know Warren Buffett said that. I said he took that from Warren Buffett. Oh, God. Okay, so he did a so poll. Uh, okay. 40, it was like over 1,000 votes. 49% said, I'm not, I don't want $10,000. I want Apple. Yeah, and I, I mean, would I would have bet it would have been I would have bet it would have been higher. That's pretty wild. Yeah, hundred percent. There's there's no other there's no other brand like that. No. Um, I pulled this from JP what JP Morgan said last week, just on the consumer overall quote: Consumer spend growth has now reverted to pre-pandemic trends, with nominal spend per customer stable and relatively flat year over year. Uh, cash buffers continue to normalize to pre-pandemic levels with lower income groups normalizing faster. Makes sense, right? Uh, end of period, depo- uh, I don't care about any of this. So if you think about, if you think about this, again, this aspirational consumer, they are calming down because the things that affect them are things like gas prices and rates and credit card rates and none of that is going in the right direction. So it, luxury will be fine. Luxury always has a built-in customer. They're just not going to have the whole world as their customers. Um, one more on this. This is watches. This comes from uh, Matt Phillips from Axios. Luxury watches are now down 35% from the peak, which you guessed it, January of 2022. This was basically an interest rate slash crypto story. The whole, the whole way up and the whole way down. Uh, actually... If you if you were to overlay interest rates, it 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 would probably look pretty obvious where this is going next. It is not about to rebound, I, I would say. What do you think about this? This is like Rolexes and uh, Breitlings and oh, we lost your audio. Sorry, it's crypto, it's startups, it's f- f- free money's gone. So it's all that. Free money's gone. That's it's it. all of that. Uh, all right, next thing. Uh, economists have flipped. So the latest quarterly survey by the Wall Street Journal, business and academic economists have lowered the probability of a recession within the next year from 54% on average in July to a more optimistic 48%. That is the first time they have put the probability of a recession below 50% since last summer. The median probability was 50%. So basically now it's a coin flip. But understand, there was a hundred percent, excuse me, a sixty-five percent certainty of recession uh, as recently as what? What does that look like to you? Late twenty twenty-two. Yeah. Or Josh, do me a favor. Go turn your TV off. Oh, all right. All right. And while he's doing that, chart off, please. So, listen. You got the the data, the evidence ostensibly that they're looking at it's changing it's changing like i was talking with benton and animal spirits there's got to be a point now i like everybody else i've been like well listen like 
it does really take a while for interest rates to filter their way through the economy. It just does. It doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. However, at some point, you have to consider the possibility that maybe, just maybe, the economy can handle 5%. And so at some point, you got to throw in the towel. Now, I'm not, I'm not pounding the table that it's over, mission accomplished, we did it. But, but you have to be open-minded to it. Look at the numbers that we saw today from retail spending. Look at right. the jobless numbers. Look at the employment data. Wages are coming right. down. Inflation's coming down. People are still spending. Like, there's reasons to think that they just might pull it off. Uh, in spite of themselves. Yeah. The, it's, it's the, yeah, not because the they nailed the, it. Not because they nailed not it. Not because they nailed it. It's just the, the situation that we're in. And uh, there's enough there's enough consumer demand fueling a demand for workers. And I'm sure it's not forever, but it is the case. Well, right guess now. what? The story that we've been telling ourselves, um, I think you maybe got to pick another story. There has to be something that comes in and disrupts. And, and there very well might be. But I yeah. don't think it's going to be simply the cost of capital increasing. It just we've we've done that already. So I have some more stuff from Matt Phillips on this uh, uh, at Axios, and Matt's been on uh, The Compound and Friends, great reporter. Unlike their counterparts in other rich nations, Americans have been burning through their pandemic-era cushion of extra cash, having a smaller... Rain da, 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 da. Oh, so uh, reports from the New York Fed and the International Monetary Fund last week spotlighted the divergence of U.S. savings behavior from that of comparable companies. Uh, the New York Fed said since 2022, the U.S. savings rate dropped below the pre-pandemic average, while savings rates all, all, at, all over the world are still higher than where they were before the pandemic. This is, this is really remarkable. I think the U.S. labor market is probably stronger than elsewhere in the world, but I just think Americans are Americans. 68% of the economy is consumption. This is what we do. We buy stuff. Yeah. We're, like, like – it, it's not going to be the case that all of a sudden everyone stops spending at once unless you have like a financial crisis. But those are so rare. And I think because in the last 20 years we, we've, we've gone through the pandemic and before that the great financial crisis, we overweight the probability of an environment where everyone all at once decides to stop spending. But it's just – it's like it's – Historically, it's not the thing that that normally happens. Uh, let's put this well, chart up. But Josh, don't you think it was reasonable to expect if you if you told a, any investor uh, chart chart off? Hold on. If you told any investor that the ten year or forget about ten year Fed funds were to go from zero to five and a quarter, that the housing market would freeze over, you would probably guess. Oh well, something's got to blow up, right? Like something. Something in the banking system, something with yes. To yes, and I think what we all learned is that somebody says, how could it not blow up? The Fed's going to take interest rates to, to 5% plus and then tell us month after month that they're leaving them there forever. How could something not blow up? Well, we know why. This, now well, we do. Hold on. Now we do. Of course. We know everything now. <laughs> the, the, the question to ask is, well, how reliant is the consumer – on overnight interest rates, if not the response is not if the response is not very, then then that's then that's where you get to where we are now. Well, it's, but it's, most it's, of us weren't asking that question. So I, I don't think yeah I just don't think we considered the the shape. Well, we did say consumers have never been better prepared for a recession. No, we we've said one. that. If we there said is, that, we said that a lot. We said it a million times. If there's and so was, and recession again, I feel you like couldn't be in better shape for for recession. Put the uh, chart. Put the yeah. chart up. Household savings compared to pre-pandemic norm in select advanced economies. So what we're showing here is Spain, France, Germany, Italy. Uh, all of these countries, you see their savings rate relatively stable, hovering around, let's call it 3% since uh, 2021. The United States saving rate is hilarious. It looks like half of a McDonald's uh, golden arches. So it goes from zero, USA, <laughs> Uh, during the height of the pandemic, it gets up to about 7%. And that's not really savings. That's like basically payments from the government, but fine, whatever. There was also nothing to do other than buy workout equipment. And now it has now plunged through the zero line, chart off, and savings rate is negative 2%. Unique among Western developed nations. That's, that's really interesting to me. 
Uh, I don't really have a great theory on it. One last thing I want to show you also from that. This is U.S. real personal spending on pleasure boats. So you and I are in here because jet skis are part of it. I mean, <laughs> this I would have thought boats would be interest rate sensitive. It's not exactly as though people show up to the boat show at Javits Center with a briefcase full of cash. There is borrowing, maybe not for everything, but you know, at least at the high end and probably the middle of the road, uh, doesn't matter. When does this turn down? U.S. real personal spending on pleasure boats this year, 23, I don't know if this is annual, this might be quarterly, whatever, 23.4 billion pre-pandemic, it was like 15. Well, I bought the top. I mean, not to, are, I we all, top, are we all not pirates to now? Chart not off. to brag, but no, chart back on. This is at the top. Literally oh, the top. Chart back, back on. There is... Uh, that, that line, that recession line, that's before and after. The world, we are living in a different world after the pandemic. We just are. And I'm not Everyone's that, working from their boats. I'm not saying that this chart is, is like going to permanently stay that way. But there is, for, with so many industries and so much, of, so much that we talk about. So retail sales today. Char, next chart, please. So I don't Yo, know. What the, hell is, what the hell is going on here? Do you, th do you think it's appropriate for economists to come off... Uh, their previous estimates of the likelihood of a recession, given all of this? Yeah, I think so. Or, and hear me out, they could fight this until it turns back around, <laughs> which is what a lot of people will do. They could say no but and come up with conditions and qualifiers, and then eventually it'll, it'll uh, all right. I don't know. Uh, I don't know, the, I don't know, I don't know what, what to say about it. Let's talk about the bond incinerator. Um, I made this chart of TLT. August 2020 from the peak to today. And it's worse. Holy shit. You know what? My bad. I, I mislabeled this chart. That's the S&P 500 during the dot-com bust. Sorry about that. Uh, it's as bad. It's down It's down 50. The S&P, I think, was down 51% during the dot-com bust. Obviously, yeah. the NASDAQ was much worse. Yeah. And I think what you're showing is that TLT has had an equivalent sell-off in percentage terms. Um, it's not obviously as many dollars. How big? No, is, not how big close. was TLT at the peak? Thirty billion. Not even close. Next, next chart, please. And so you say, like, why aren't investors panicking? We spoke about this last week, and there's there's two reasons. Number one, to Josh's point, there's thirty eight billion dollars in TLT, uh, which is actually, which is that's actually it? no, but that Josh, that's close to an all time high. In in January two thousand twenty two, there's only twenty billion. So this is the thing that's confounding people. Is like how is how are how are assets under management going up when the price just continues to bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed? And bleed Does bleed. anyone? Let me ask you a question. Does anyone in our world in wealth management use actual thirty year treasury bonds in separate accounts for clients? This can't. Would, it's not all, it, it can't be all retail. No, markets. I know. This is this is the ETF. I'm asking yeah. though. Do any large pools of capital and wealth like like? Do any of the $50 billion, $100 billion institutions you, or, or bigger utilize actual treasury bonds in separate accounts for clients? Or is everyone either using a mutual fund or TLT just for long-term bond exposure I'm talking about, which admittedly that's, is a small slice of people's allocation? Yeah, I, I don't know. I think – yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know anyone that does. But we, we, we were talking about, we were wondering last week, like, how is money still going in? And well, wait, well, here's why I'm asking you that question, though. Because if you, because if, let's say you have a 4% sleeve of long-term treasuries, and that's your, like, disaster hedge, mm -hmm. right? I know it's the disaster this year, but I'm saying, like, that's what you're using it for. If you own that in f actual, I was going to say physical, if you own that in actual treasury bonds that have a maturity date, you kind of can like just live through it easier than if you own that through TLT, where it's just in your face all day how much that ETF is declining. I know the asset value will reflect the decline no matter what form you own it in, but if you keep saying to yourself, well, if I don't sell until the bond matures, I can't lose money, like it's sort of true. You think people so are using, you think people are, are oh, well, I'm asking, I don't, 20 I don't know, but behave, no, I don't. Trades in SMAs, well, no somebody chance. is. No, Somebody not is, SMAs. But I don't, not an SMAs. Okay, that's I what I'm asking so. you. I don't know I the don't answer to so. that. No, I, I, I don't I know don't anyone doing so. that. But behaviorally, could you see that being of some benefit? No, to just owning, dude. If it's like, oh, great, my twenty thirty eight bond. 
Yeah, it's trading at <laughs> 63 cents of the dollar. but by Never selling it. By I'm selling it at 2038. 20, 20, yeah, no, I don't think so. I, I hear what you're saying, but not in this case. So my, so okay. the question is, so, so how is money still piling in? Well, because bonds are much more attractive than they were. Ben and I were talking about this today. The 30-year, if, if rates were to go up 50 basis points, they would fall, whatever, 4%. But if rates, if rates, I'm sorry, if rates rise 50 basis points from here, the thing would fall 4%. That's not the actual number. But if rates fall 50 basis points, it would go up like 13%. Like the risk reward yeah, is, it's, is it's asymmetric. An a, it's an asymmetric. I'm so glad you brought this up too. Here's what's, here's what's different between stocks and, and treasury bonds. If you buy a stock, let's say a high quality stock, and it gets cut in half, right? Like the way TLT did. There's no guarantee that it's a better buy down 50%. It could be down 50% on its way to zero. Mm -hmm. Like it's going to be company specific and there's so much uncertainty. If you buy a portfolio of treasury bonds, I don't give a shit what the maturity is, and it gets cut in half and it's U.S. treasury bonds, either you're predicting World War III to avoid buying it or it's an obvious no-brainer. And that to me explains why there's still $38 billion in TLT and that AUM is at a record high. Oh, I because think it's, it's an obvious. Not the same. I think it's, it's an not obvious the no same brainer. As stocks getting cut in half. It's an obvious right. no brainer. Not in the sense that it can't go down another fifteen percent. Who's to say? No, it's that who gives a shit if it goes down exactly. Another 15%. But if it does, good, buy more. That's uh, right. I'm with you. I'm with you on that. Right, I think next, there's a next, lot of rebalancing that that explains uh, the inflows into TLT also. So wait, hold on. There's one more chart. There's one more chart. There's a red and a black line, please. There we go. Okay. So again, the, I wrote QQQ, daily change, my bad. That's the S&P 500. But this is the daily change during the dot-com blow up. So yes, there have been some really bad days for TLT, but it's not like there's no, it's not disastrous days. You know what I mean? There's not like back-to-back -back down 5% days like there was. It's a, gr it's a grind. It's a grind. So it just, it, it wears it down. But I want to talk about, I want to get back to this idea of people thinking, understandably so, that rising interest rates must be bad for the stock market, right? Because cost of capital, investor preference, like all that sort of stuff, which intuitively makes yeah. sense, but it's just not true. So Brian Belsky shows the S&P 500 average rolling one-year performance based on the year-to-year -year change in the 10-year treasury yield. And actually, huh, look at that. It has averaged 13.6% 13 when it's rising and 6.5% when it's falling. I'd like so to solve the at, puzzle. Wait, hold on. Last thing, last thing before you solve it. And it's not, you might say, well, we've been in a declining market since 1990. Well, not, not really. Next chart, please. There's been multiple periods. Where, so the shaded areas, as you can see, indicate where interest rates have risen. There's been one, two, three, four, five, like almost nine of them. There's been a lot of periods where interest rates have yeah, risen. They've been go right. ahead. There have been, there have been, there have been, bond, there, right. So what, go back to the previous. Um, so... This is basically saying the the year to year change in the ten year treasury rate versus the S and P five hundred average rolling one year performance. Right. So we're saying like when like what is the optimal time to be in stocks? Well, we know that it's when bonds are between fifty and hundred basis points because that's no, when no, there's no, just no, major. No, 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 Josh, higher than the year before. Oh, 50 basis points it's higher the, than the It's not before. the absolute level. So uh, again, oh. this is you would you would think yeah, exactly. Head head uh there's a mind uh face All right, blower. I have no opinion then. Wait, it's a I have, now blower. I have no opinion. <laughs> it's a face uh, blower. I think because when rates are rising, things are gen generally like getting better with the economy, maybe that that would be like an explanation. What do you think? Well, throw that chart back on. Let's look at periods when when the when the market when the interest rates have been rising. So 2016 to 2018, well, that wasn't a great year. That wasn't a great period for stocks. We had a tightening cycle What do you then. mean? Seven, oh, 2017 was, was, Trump, was uh, That's true. Trump, sa Trump saved uh, America, remember? That's true. 16 and 18 weren't great. We had a massive, we had a massive tax cut. It was uh, 2017 was hot shit. Listen, I don't know that I have a great explanation. All of this is to say, just because interest rates are rising doesn't mean you sell all your bonds. That's all. We have, Belsky, we have Belsky coming on soon, and he'll explain it to us. All right, what's next? All right, let's look at investment grade maturity by sector uh, versus high yield. So what this is showing is U.S. investment grade share of bonds maturing in 2024 by sector for investment grade and high yield. And, of course, high yield is just, you know, you, you're not getting a 10-year 10 10 loan if you're a high yield company, which actually yeah. helped them, which helped them a lot yeah. in 2022. But eventually, so this is where it's going to matter. 
do do rising interest rates do do oh, rising overnight rates impact the consumer directly? Well, sure, if they're buying a car, if they're buying a house, obviously. But in other ways, there are indirect uh, ramifications, and this is this this matters. Like rolling your bar and costs at much higher levels, it absolutely matters. Right. Yeah. There's no way around it. It just it takes time before it takes effect. Next What's chart. The next one. So this is the S and P 500 versus the Russell 2000. And what we're showing is the S and P. This is from Bank of America. The S and P 500 debt is maturing in manageable chunks, but not the Russell 2000. So you wonder why are Russell 2000 companies under pressure? Well, here's why. This is not a mystery. Look at the maturities. So you're going to hear this term a lot in the coming quarters: uh, maturity cliff. And there's a lot of debt that has to be rolled. And unfortunately for the Russell 2000, and I think rightfully reflect, by the way, Russell 2000 over two years is down 21%. The S the S&P is up uh, like five. Next chart, so, same thing. The, rightfully this, so. This, this is the, <laughs> the share of, of high yield market maturing within 36 it's months. Matur maturity wall. Okay. If these yeah, companies, if interest rates stay where they are, if they stay higher for longer, these companies are going to be in a world of pain. So that's what the bankruptcy attorneys are waiting for. And uh, I have a good friend who's a bankruptcy attorney, and he's like, we're, we were very slow last year. This year, we're not as slow. Next year, we're canceling our vacations. So that's, that's, just, that's the way they view the markets. They are following these focus lists of companies that are about to become really profitable clients. So uh, I want to say them. one more thing. So... For the companies of the lower quality and the smaller size, like uh, I was listening to Delta's call, 89% of Delta's debt is long-term fixed. 89% of it with a weighted average interest rate of 4.5%. They're fine, right? All of those companies are, are better than fine. Yeah, you're looking in the wrong place, right? But the non-Deltas of the world, those yeah. companies are up shit's creek. And also, like, not to get into this can of worms, but at some point, doesn't, like, U.S. government borrowing matter all right we have eight <laughs> minutes left we're not going to do that today uh right aid just filed for bankruptcy so you're going to see a bunch of those all right uh can we spend one minute on sure. crypto yeah what is this what's the latest bullshit with this uh grayscale thing so it was a rumor some somebody somebody jumped the gun and said oh so another... so i know it's not the, the sec declined to appeal the ruling that grayscale won over the weekend, everyone was saying it's only a matter of uh, minutes now until we get an actual ETF. And then on was yesterday, somebody spread a rumor or maybe did it on purpose or whatever that BlackRock got their spot Bitcoin ETF approved. And then BlackRock said, no, that's not true. And now what? What did I miss today? Nothing today. Uh, but so so the spike from 28,000 to 30,000 basically went away. But Bitcoin's at twenty eight five. It was at twenty six oh, so, five. So over the on weekend. the so 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 it was Coin Telegraph, which is a media company in the crypto space, put out a tweet, and the price of Bitcoin ran up two thousand dollars. But it had, uh, it had already been acting well. But it went from twenty eight up to thirty, and that backed up to twenty eight. The thing that I want to discuss real quick is Larry Fink was on Fox Business yesterday, and he he described it as a flight to quality in crypto treasures and gold i almost couldn't believe my ears i love it i love it he hated crypto so much when it first came out but is this I, just I really to get is this just uh, i mean it's a lot of money yes. I'm, like yeah just to get 10 billion dollars into it's not going to be 10 billion dollars homeboy it's going to it's going to be 100 billion dollars it's not going to be into, gonna win. Into, into, into iShares into iShares etf you don't know that listen to me and look into my crystalline blue eyes no i don't I feel like you it. No. BlackRock is going to win. They're going to have a 50 basis point spot Bitcoin ETF that takes all the money, all of it. It will be no different than GLD. It'll be no different than SPY. This you will know, be a but, winner. You know the assets take in all GLD? Business. It'll be a great, it's going to be a great fucking business for BlackRock. You, you know the assets in GLD? Not much these days. 50 billion. Okay, but who, what's the next closest gold fund? Six? IAU. Two? Right. I don't, I'm I don't, telling I don't. You. I don't know about ETFs that. Right. are a winner. E ETFs are a winner take all business nah. in the major ca in the major categories. How many? Yes, they how many? No, it's not, dude. How, every single one, every single asset manager has ten billion dollars in an S and P five hundred ETF. It's not true. Is that a great? Is that a great at three basis points? Is that a great business? Not. No, I don't think. But you're moving the goalposts. Okay. I'm I, saying I, you might be right. You might be right, but you might not be. Who's going to beat BlackRock at this? Kathy Wood. 
grayscale. I, I just it's hard for me to picture them not winning. They'll go they'll, they'll go to the lowest price, they'll have the highest security, they'll market the shit out of it. You won't be able to avoid their marketing. All right, let's let me ask you win. this. Let me ask you this because there will be fee pressure all over the fucking place. Yeah. In definitely. in 2 years from in them two, from in them. Two, in 2 years is a Bitcoin ETF under 20 basis points. Oh, that's a good question. Like how fast will that normalize to what other category killer ETFs have become. In other words, I, I guess know. the reason the reason why I say this is I can't believe that Larry Fink would say that just because he's trying to shell the Bitcoin ETF. Maybe I'm naive. I mean, maybe of course he is, but I mean, he did, he did like he did like 5 years of uh ES, ESG shtick. That's true. All right. Because that I mean, right. this is okay, their you're job. Right. You're right. You're right. Uh, what you're right. you right. what would right. you be doing if you were Larry Fink? You'd be you'd right. be You'd be talking that talk. This is all right. Let's, we're let's all working about, for a living. Let's talk. Right, you're yeah. right. Yeah. Let's talk about Come the on. non, the other bubble, the not, the non AI bubble. Uh, Carl Quintanilla tweeted Bank of America on GLP ones. Now we're calling them GLP ones. I, I, I just discovered this phrase, these, this acronym two days ago. What does it stand yeah. for? So it's, it's like the, the thing that the, it's getting inhibited so that you don't want to eat and drink and smoke and, and, uh, be, be, uh, it's epic. Uh, right, but they want to like they want to like. There's going to be like ten of them. There are three of them or four of them right now. There are going to be like ten of them in the next year. It stands so for it gave a the glucagon, category name. glucagon like peptide. Okay, sure. All right. So the GLP ones returns this high suggests a story has become obvious, popular, and is likely in its final innings. Extra innings are always possible, but chasing here is really hard. And they I hashtag agree. Uh, Eli Lilly. Uh, look at this. I agree. I agree. So it's long and XLV versus short the disruption risk. The disruption and, risk stocks have gotten killed. And we don't have this chart ready, but if you want a if you want a cautionary tale, why not to chase a hot health theme? Ladies and gentlemen, may I present Moderna? Oh, I forgot. Yeah. I saw that chart today. Moderna Holy is trading moly. like Moderna is trading like AMC if the CEO was also smoking crack on Twitter. Like I can't even describe how bad that's down eighty oh percent from the, from the approval of the drug. It's like round trip the whole thing. It's These lost eighty percent of its market cap. Moderna, right. so, Johnson and Johnson and Pfizer. I mean Johnson so and Johnson is a little bit different. Piece, if you but. need a reason, if you need a reason not to go all in on GLP one drug stocks, Moderna. Okay, uh, make the case. I'm gonna do this really quickly. Uh, ITA, this is defense. We just got an earnings report from Lockheed. Uh, it was just okay. Nothing special. Lockheed's the third largest component of ITA. John, you want to pop that chart? Um, this is the 10-year look at the, I guess, an iShares Aerospace and Defense ETF. And I know this is going to work because I just sold it a couple of months ago. Uh, this has been acting like shit all year. It's not like a trash. secret what? No, nope. hold on. Hold on. It's not a secret why. Anytime there is debt ceiling stuff going on in Congress, all of these aerospace and defense program spends look like they're going to be at risk, but they never actually are. We have an unlimited amount of money that we love to spend on rockets and bombs and engines. So uh, I think that thematically, for the next, oh, unfortunately, for the next couple of years, defense is going to be a hot theme. We seem to be shooting off a lot of rockets and bombs and missiles uh, in the present environment. That doesn't look like it's going to stop. All of that needs to be replenished. Here are your top, I don't know, 12 holdings. Uh, RTX, which formerly was known as Raytheon, is 17%. Boeing is 17%. That's probably uh, not great. Uh, Lockheed Martin, Northrop Grumman, General Dynamics, L3, Textron. Uh, I don't know Listen, any. All these I don't know any of these companies well enough. I just know I want to be in the category. I'm probably gonna have to buy this thing back. Okay. Well, I just scrolled through all of them. They look like they all look like trash. I because there is a debt ceiling debate okay. currently underway. It will not last forever. These stocks will begin to trade on what they should trade on, which is our endless capacity for war. Okay. Okay. Next. Uh, Mystery chart. All right. Watch me get this first try. You're not going to. This thanks, does thanks is for this your, uh, faith. You know what this is, Josh? This is what you would call a bottoming process. Is this would a you stock? not? Would you not call this, this a bottoming process? I would. 
Next chart, please. That's, that's, a, da- that's a daily look. It's an, inverse head and sh- it's an inverse head and shoulders. And this is a weekly look. So, you know, not not exactly higher lows, but it's, uh, again, this, this is a weekly. So we're going back to the summer. So now are back to the give, daily. Are you going to give me a clue? Are you give me a clue? Now back to the daily. Okay. This is uh, a ratio chart. So it's uh, the denominator is the S- large. The denominator is the S and P five hundred. Okay. And the numerator, which is in the process of bottoming, is a company that uh, is one of the iconic American brands. Oh, bottoming, bottoming versus the S and P. I hate these. And bottoming in general. Uh, you don't need. You don't need. You don't need the the denominator. Disney. It close. <laughs> It closed it. at the highest level since August uh, 22nd. You got it. Sold it's to you. Are you in? Are you in it? I you mean, yeah, it? I'm in it. Yeah. No, I mean, it's it's one of my smaller Sold positions, but whatever. It's got earnings you, in two you weeks. See that it, you see that it, it looked like it was bottoming versus the S&P in August also, right? And it's, then there was a trap Josh, door in the floor. It's a process. It's a process, yeah. my friend. It's, it's early in the process. All right. Hey, guys. Did you know that tomorrow and every Wednesday for the rest of your life, there will be a brand new episode of Animal Spirits on your favorite podcast player. That's Michael Badnick, Ben Carlson, my favorite podcast. Make sure to listen. Later this week, we'll have an all new Ask the Compound. If you want to get a question to Ben to be answered on air, here's how you do it. Send an email to askthecompoundshow at gmail.com. Duncan and Nicole read all the emails that come in. Uh, speaking of which, great job on the show today, Duncan, Nicole. Thank you, John. Great job with all the charts. And thank you guys so much for watching and listening. We'll see you soon.